increasing enthusiast. My name is uh, Philip Pou. I'm a software engineer, a software developer at the uh, HS Development Engineering Financial and Process here. I've been working on um, Babel Trace 2, which is uh, my subject for this presentation for the last two, three years. And I'm the author of uh, Bab uh, Bear CTF, and um, I have interest in trace reading softwares and uh, trace formats. Uh, this talk is about how I optimize Babel Trace 2. Uh, I will show what is Babel Trace 2 for the ones who don't know that project. Uh, once it was feature complete, and how the techniques uh, could apply to other trace features as well. So this is our content for this presentation. Typical way of let's just jump into it. Um, so yeah, what is Babel Trace 2? I won't jump into the details. Jeremy uh, Arno here made a wonderful talk about that. The last tracing summit 2017. Uh, I have a link on the next slide. So it's a, the high level overview is that it's a plugin based trace converter or processor or analyzer um, written in C. It is plugin based so it is extensible through plugins uh, which you can write in C, C++ or Python. It is a library and a CLI. So the CLI tool uses the library. Um, it has or will have a stable C and Python API. So right now it's still under development, but it's almost done. We said, this, we said the same thing last year. And sorry, and um, it is cross-platform for those three uh, major OSs. Um, so this is how it works basically. So the concept is that you will trace a processing graph and connect sources, filters, and sinks and then around the graph. So sources, filters, and sinks are, are directly um, instantiated from plugins. So event record, event record objects are created by sources, transformed by filters, and then processed, uh, converged, uh, converted or analyzed by sinks. With this approach, we can reuse filters and sinks uh, for many input formats and vice versa. So we use many input formats. There are many output formats for a single input format. Um, so in this example, the yellow filter, the color lines I will point to the yellow filter. The middle one is um, a Muxer filter. So uh, it's a plugin which orders <coughs> event records coming from different streams into a single stream of ordered events so that the red sink here can process them. And in this case it's a pretty printing sink, so it just pretty prints each event record to the console. I can show you a really quick demo. So, So this is a CLI. Uh, I'm running Babel Trace, uh, pointing my LTTNG trace, which is a CTF trace, so it's using the CTF source, uh, setting, enabling colors for less to see them. So each row here is an event record, and they are ordered by them. So Babel Trace exists uh, since uh, about 8, 9, 2010. 2010. So Babel Trace 2 is the, the upcoming version. Babel Trace 1 it would be the current version. So this is not new to many of you because uh, it has been existing for many years. So for Babel Trace 2, the, our initial design goals because Babel Trace 2 is extensible thanks to plugins, our initial goals were all about the API. So for it to be stable, uniform, and safe. So by uniform, I mean 
that all objects are shared. So in our design, a source plugin can create an object, like an event record object, which a sync then keeps thanks to reference counting, even if the source disappears. So you can move objects between plugins and reference counting keeps them alive. Um, and a safe, safe API for us means that functions do not continue or stack fault with invalid parameters. So they validate all parameters. We'll come back to, to what this means exactly. So the problem we got is that we, I mean, using or considering those initial goals, we implemented Babel Truth 2. Then we tried it, and it was feature complete. It was, we thought it was perfect. And then we compared it to Babel Trace 1, which is the current version. It was 3, 13 times slower. And this is, well, for us, it's unacceptable because it's a major bump, and current users expect um, at least the same performance from this major update. So we, we needed to do something about that. So before releasing Power Trace 2 and freezing its API, um, we wanted to make sure that we were not making ourselves into a corner, that the API was not making impossible future optimizations. So Steven said it uh, earlier this morning, it's very hard to come up with an API and say, okay, this is final and it will remain stable and has this for many years. So, well, hopefully, so <laughs> we need to to make sure that we can freeze it, actually. So, first thing I did, um, I run perf record and perf report, and I got those results. And what you can see in yellow are reference count change functions. So our bt get and bt put functions, those are the functions incrementing and decrementing uh, reference counts. So they are very expensive, uh, the topmost functions here along with the allocating and deallocating functions. So your typical MADAC and free and uh, specialized allocators uh, like the one from GDM that we use. So this is a performance issue, obviously. So we needed to focus uh, onto that. Uh, and then thanks to uh, GDB, I noticed that the stack trace was somewhat, somewhat large. When reaching the source functions, uh, and because in our current design, a downstream plugin eventually calls, uh, calls a upstream plugin and then it calls again an upstream plugin and so on, uh, this looked like a lot of function calls for each single event record. So, what happens here is that the thing, which is in red here, here and here. Um, it calls functions from the filter plugin and then from the source plugin and then <laughs> test. Okay. Um, yeah, so when that this is the stack trace and the colors indicate to which uh, plugin the function is located. So for each event record, you go through all that stack every time. So so far, that's the observation. And um, yeah, so just keep that in mind for future stuff. Um, um, so yeah, so my first hypothesis was that given that what we saw on the perf report previously, even that reference counting and the reallocations and the allocations look very costly. Um, less reference count and less mirror allocations and the allocations should lead to more performance. I have a second hypothesis, and this one is only based on intuition, but I noticed that we validated the parameters of a lot of functions called on the fast path. So my my hypothesis was that by removing this parameter validation, um, those branches and those statements, uh, we would see some performance improvements. So I wanted to verify that. 
And finally, as I explained earlier about going up and down the stack for each and every word, um, I, I asked myself, why not making each plugin request more event reports at a time to the uh, or from the upstream plugin, so as to reduce the number of function calls and returns, therefore reducing the number of executed instructions and increasing the performance. So in this in this example, we would still have the orange function calls and returns, but we would um, avoid the purple ones. So this is like an example for four event reports at a time instead of a single one each time. So this is pretty much what I, what I just said. Should lead to, well, hypothesis is that, is that it will lead to more performance. Um, this is your typical testing configuration slide. I'm not going through all the details. Um, I built with all the optimizations enabled, no debugging, no logging, uh, clear the VM caches before executing, and then I just run a very simple graph, which is a 1.4 gigabyte um, LTTNG kernel trace with four data streams. Um, this is read by a CTF source, then goes to the master filter to order them, and then to a dummy sync, which just gets the event report objects and discards them. Um, so what we measure is the total execution time, so it's close to a real-life scenario. Um, we compare to Babel Trace um, 5, 1.5, sorry, which uh, is built and running with the same parameters. So this is um, my optimization journey. On uh, the horizontal axis is uh, the commit ID, which made a change, hopefully, to make it faster. And uh, the vertical axis is execution time, total execution time for the parameter parameters I just, I'm just explained. Um, the dotted line right here is our baseline, so it's double trace 1.5. So you can see that, well, we went from 12.5 times to 2.5 times uh, slower than the one is 1.5, so quite an achievement. And um, so we can see two major improvement phases on this one and this one. And the next slides will explain um, what are those exactly. So, as said previously, um, there were initially a lot of fast path function parameter validation. This is because one of our initial goals, as told earlier, was a super safe API. So the call function uh, validates each parameter during runtime. Uh, sometimes it goes recursively into complex objects and then returns an error code if anything is invalid. And then the user, the caller, needs to validate that or to check the the return uh, code or return value and uh, handle the error. Um, yeah, and sort of some examples of checks are your typical null check, our bound check, and object type check, and the value range check. For example, if you pass some, some integer value that needs to be greater than zero, and that's it. So we have, well, when designing a library API, we have different approaches. Um, the system call approach, for example, is to be super safe, and that it cannot cause a kernel boost. Um, and on the opposite, some libc functions are not super safe, like the length of a string, when you pass a pointer, it just cycles. So the caller needs to pass a value value. So my question was, can we find a compromise between those two approaches? That is, safety and speed. So I came up with those precondition assertion macros. Um, there's also a new developer mode, which is a build-time mode. So you can enable or disable at build-time this developer mode, so as to get either a developer build or a production build. In developer mode, those macros print an error 
uh, when executed, or what their replacement when the replacement is executed. Uh, so they put an error message when the precondition is not satisfied. And in production mode, uh, the checks are just they don't exist. Uh, so it's a no up in production mode. Uh, those are examples of um, usages. So uh, the, like the generic one, for example, check if the size parameter is greater than zero, and then there's a message that would be printed if it's not satisfied. Um, or check that some parameter is not null when we enter a new function. So this is kind of like before and after uh, this kind of, of, of change. Um, so all the branches or conditionals um, on the left become precondition assertion macros on the right. So the checks are the same in developer mode, but they don't exist in production. Um, yeah. And this is um, this is an error message example uh, when a precondition is not satisfied. Um, we're passing, in this example, example, we are passing an unsigned integer field to a function which expects a signed integer field. So we get the message here, fields type is unsigned, it's supposed to be signed. Um, so the error is printed to a standard uh, error stream uh, with some contextual detail on the value and other parameters if, if it can help. And then, have you ever seen such a big abort function flow? It aborts. So uh, why we abort? Because as soon as there's a broken precondition, we don't want to continue executing the, pro executing the program because it would continue with invalid or erroneous um, data or parameters. So what you can do is you you run you, well you run value trace with your custom plugin, uh, loading your custom plugin with GDB, and then it will break at this abort, and you inspect the context. Why the board and um, look at the, the error message, try to figure out why it fixed the issue, and then try to maybe you'll get another unsatisfied precondition until it finally, work, finally works. And then you know that in production mode, you won't have any invalid data or invalid parameter passed to the library. So, this is the gain that we got uh, from this change. It's, uh, it's substantial went from uh, well, 27%, the other one on the right, uh, the 26% was a fix that was added, but it's in, the, it's in the same category. So as you can see, we get uh, yeah, quite a bit. So I'm happy with that. Um, that's a lot of so in Battle Trace 2, there are a lot of objects that are allocated and deallocated for each single inventory core. So this is an example of a sketch switch inventory core object with all its single, well, individual um, field objects. So you see your typical prep, uh, prep theory and so on. Those are uh, actually allocated for each allocated sketch switch inventory core object. So the birth re uh, report that I showed you earlier confirms this that allocation and the allocation are bottlenecks at this point in the optimization phase. So well just for this get switch inventory record, there are 15 field objects and other objects like plug values, for example, are also allocated for each uh, element record. So they are allocated by the source. And eventually, this symmetry board moves through the graph until it reaches a sink, which discards it, and then everything is deallocated, and we start again. So, yeah, and as a reference, our test trace, that was a 1.4 gigabyte SVPNG trace, contains about 42 million symmetry boards. So, uh, it's an important uh, issue. So, it turns out that Many event record objects actually have the same exact same layout because they are described initially in the trace by the same metadata. 
So for example, our test trace has, like I just said, 42 million event records, but it only has a thousand different event record layouts or event record types. So we can use event record object pools per event record type. So each event record type in Power Trace 2, starting well with this optimization, uh, has its own pool of event records, which all share the same layout. So the idea is that with an event record object pool, when you create an event record, it is taken from the pool and its reference count is set to 1. Um, at this point, all its field objects, the green ones that we saw here, are already allocated. So we don't need to allocate everything that's under it um, And the event record object would only be allocated along with all, all its field objects if the pool was empty, which is the case initially for all event record types. Um, and then, when an event record object's reference count falls back to zero, we return it to its initial pool, original pool. So it becomes true again to be reused. Um, there was one issue with that approach, uh, is that a plugin cannot keep a reference to a field object which is inside the event record, which is also owned by this event record object, because then the event record object is not reusable because there's like an external owner. So you can have, like this, for example, this event record in red, you could not reuse it because then the new owner would modify the field that is still supposed to be the old field wanted to by or referenced by the plugin which kept the reference to it. So our solution to that to deal with that um, is that the field objects are now unique, so they are not shared anymore, they don't have a reference count. Uh, they are uniquely owned by the event record object, which is their parent. Um, and the event record object themselves are still shared, so a plugin can keep a reference to an, an event record, but not to a single field. So if a plugin needs uh, to keep the value of a single field, it needs to copy this field's content, for example, integers, strings, or more complex structures, and so on, or keep a reference to the whole, whole event record. Um, the trade-off is that of doing that is that the API becomes less uniform. So I said initially that our goal was that the whole API exposes objects which are reference counted or can be shared. Now some objects are like field objects and there are a few others are considered unique so you can't get and put a reference, they have only one reference. And some other are shared so it's a bit more complex but it's still usable in my opinion. Um, yeah, so uh, keeping the event records shared and uh, allows multiple plugins to uh, to have a reference to a single object so for analysis and conversion purposes, for example. How about reference counting? So the first report that I showed you earlier, it also showed that there were a lot of reference count change um, functions that were covered. That is, a lot of calls to BT get and BT put. So I found the pattern in the code where, like most functions, um, do not need to keep a reference past their own scope. So this means that they only need to borrow objects, do something with it, and then they don't need to keep that object outside. Um, so they don't need to get new references because they always put references. So in this example, this is we're getting like a trace object from a stream class object, and this is BT stream class get. So this get means it's calling BT get internally, so we're increasing the reference count of this trace object, then doing something with it and putting it at the end of the, of the function. Instead of that, we can just do borrow trace, so the reference count doesn't change, do our things, and then we don't have to put so this. This avoids this. Yeah, it avoids calling BT get and BT put every time. Again, the trade-off is that the API is less uniform, so 
you have some functions that borrow, some functions that get, so you need to know when you're calling a borrow, borrowing function, you don't call the input, because that would lead to a reference count eventually calling those, and some functions get, so you need to know those functions. Um, this is a before and after, uh, well, perf reports before and after this pooling and uh, reference counting optimization. So, um, yellow and red, again, are allocation, <coughs> delegation, and reference count change functions. So, you can see that after, which is the report below. Um, they are completely gone, so that's a good thing. And now it's starting to show that the new bottleneck seems to be functions from the CTF. Um, source. So that's probably our next um, focus. So now, yeah, so the big drop, the big gain for this uh, object pooling and less reference count optimization. So that's pretty much where we are right now. Um, of course, we're very happy with this outcome. And finally, um, I had a look, uh, I had a look into transferring batches of error reports uh, from plugin to plugin instead of a single, like I explained earlier. In this case, um, yeah, it is more the same stuff. So we, we would be uh, transferring batches of four error reports instead of one error report each time to save function call returns, so to save instructions. Um, because I only wanted to test the impact on the graph API itself, I excluded the CDF source and the boxer from this test, and I created a very simple graph which generates uh, 200 million elementary reports, and then a sync which discards them, which is still our So it has no false analysis, it has no console output, it has no boxer output. So I tried a few different batch sizes. What I saw thanks to perfstat is that the number of instructions decreases. So, mark it. That is the number of instructions. So it decreases from a batch size of uh, one event report, so that's our initial, uh, situa in our initial situation, down to about 70, and then it stabilizes as we increase the batch size. However, the primary cache pressure uh, builds up, and then eventually we fall to uh, having to make references to the last level cache. We see that starting to increase, and we also see the execution time starting to increase. So we have to find some sort of sweet spot um, in terms of batch size between instruction count and, and last level cache references. Uh, we can see that in my specific configuration, it's about 30. It could change. So we want to remain on the conservative size, uh, side. Sorry. And so the results are that, as you saw previously, we're going from about 70 seconds to a about 11, 12 seconds total exit time. So we're saving what I computed is that we're saving 25 milliseconds per million event records and that's a constant um, constant gain. So whatever the input or source and sync you're using, uh, this is always safe. However, question is, is it beneficial right now? Um, since our total runtime is currently at, well, it's for Babel Trace 2, it's currently 62 seconds. This uh, leads to a gain of 1.7%, so not so much interesting right now. Um, the target is Babel Trace 1.5, to be on par with Babel Trace 1.5, which is at 24.5 seconds. So this would increase the gain to 4 or 5%. Four so still not that much, but it gets more interesting when you add more optimizations, which make the whole Rough time uh, go lower. Um, so we're not quite sure about this one. And you can see this is the patch which implemented that and it didn't change anything in our specific case. 
So, well, this is just the results, the total results with all the optimizations I've located. Um, of course, we still have more to do, but uh, we really improved the performance of Bowtrace 2 by making optimizations which require making changes to the API. That's what's important. Um, because I, um, I put the perf report, the current perf report at the end for R1, and uh, the more, most expensive calls now are um, the CTF source, uh, CTF source functions and Moxer filter functions. So uh, because they are in their own plugin, um, we can release Double Trace 2 very soon with its current API and optimize those plugins later. So it will be in 2.1, for example. Um, so this is the next focus. So what's for future work then? Um, when you think about it, uh, LTTNG, UST, and LTTNG modules are just tracer generators, or actually tracer generators. So for example, with LTTNG, UST, you define your uh, event record metadata with C processor macros in a, well, with custom mac LTTNG, UST macros, and then through the preprocessor, they get converted into custom C statements, which are generated for your specific uses. So when executed, the application, your application, generates uh, event records into data streams and metadata into a metadata stream. And so far, the solution proved to be very efficient. So I asked myself, why not go the opposite way? So the exact opposite way is you take um, well, I tried that. I wrote an experimental program which takes the CTF metadata and generates a C file to decode this the exact data stream that are in the districts where the metadata was located. So then you link it with your own application, which uses the event report objects to uh, perform some conversion or analysis work, and then do something with the input. So this is just a mirror of what LTTNG does. So it's, it's the consuming side of all well, of the tricks. So those are the results. So it looks very promising. It's 10 times faster than the Trace 1.5 um, with the same build flags and run, run configuration, so same tricks. Um, and of course, really, really faster than Babel Trace 2. Um, just one side note is that, to be perfectly honest, the generated trace reader does not validate the trace, which I will trace 1.5 and 2 do. So for example, if the packet, uh, like I will trace reads individual uh, CTF packets, and if, it, if one packet is smaller than the expected packet size, in I will trace you will get an error in this generated uh, trace reader, you will get uh, erased data or we would just fail. So we have to add that. And so it would be slower in reality, but by how much? I can't say I didn't try it yet. Um, but for me, this experiment just demonstrate, demonstrates that the JIT compilation uh, path, optimization path based on the metadata is definitely something to investigate in the future for the power to see that source. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the conclusion. So the optimization results are so far we went from 12.5 to 2.5 times double trace 1.5. Uh, we saw that using object pools so as to avoid allocations in the allocations uh, increases the performance when you create this a lot of objects which have the, have the same binary layout. And this is the case of both trace readers. Um, not validating any API function preconditions increases performance when fast path functions are applied. Um, that using patches of event reports in this specific case with the graph system instead of 
uh, instead of handling a single entry for each time. Could be faster, but it's not currently with the current numbers of vouchers too. Uh, and of course, the trade-off for all those optimizations is that the API is affected, so it's less uniform, it's riskier. But then again, you can make it safer in developer mode, and then make it faster in production mode. And for future work, um, I'll definitely look, definitely look to uh, just-in-time compilation of um, custom event report and data stream readers for the source side of CTF. Of a voucher So um, that's it for me. Any question? Question? Or you can come see me after a while if you're too shy. That's one. Why make the fields of the event vectors their own objects? Versus what? Just uh, the record is an object and the last field. Yeah, well, now it's pretty much like you say. I mean, they are unique to the object, to the, to the event record object. So they are not allocated and deallocated each time. And they are objects because the whole API is uses like opaque structures. So we want to use like specific function calls for integer fields, for string fields, for structure fields, for example. So nothing is exposed in header files. The actual layout of the structures, I mean. Other questions? One for the You be very careful about the machine when you open to this uh, API. Is it possible for people to start looking or uh, playing with this API even if it's not ready uh, before it's officially uh, released? Yeah, it depends on um, what amount of work you want to put when it changes again. But it, the only changes that are left now are small function renaming to make the uh, API terminology uh, uniform. But I mean, the, well, currently the uh, optimizations are in my, my own branch, but they will be merged soon into master. And then you could start, yeah, you could start experimenting because we have something like eight or nine plugins already, so you can look at those and use those as examples. Okay, thank you very much. Let's take the discussion offline with the subject for us and we would like to do so. Yeah, it's okay. More questions? Thank you. Oh, one more. One. Uh, you mentioned you wanted the API to be safe. Mm -hmm. um, and then you introduced the borrow function yeah. for performance reason. Yeah. The way I understood it, the borrow function doesn't check that you actually release the no. reference. No, well, you don't need to release it. Well, because you promised not to actually keep it, right? That's it. But there isn't anything formally checking. No. And that's just a compromise performance versus safety. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's where you need to be careful. So um, there are other APIs that look like Valtrus's API, like C Python's API for example, in which you implement and implement Python objects, Py objects. And um, they don't check that either, but there are some static uh, analyzers which can like you can put this reference will be used externally and the static analyzer won't check if you put it or get it afterwards. So we could look into Customizing some, like using a C line plugin or something for to perform analysis. One, one alternative that might be possible would be to do a borrow and unborrow, 
and the upper row could be a NOAA in production mode, and it could be recounting in addition in the upper mode. That could work. Maybe. We'll talk. I suspect that still occurs in problem of function calls, unless you start converting everything into macros. So if you're doing it with performance, maybe. <coughs> yeah, but in production, then it could become really a static in mind. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, one other.